Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Austria's finest naturally authentic pumpkin seed oil from the Steiermark, available at organicuniverse.com. Listeners of The Organic View can receive a dollar off their purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. For more promotional offers, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. And don't forget to check out our contest section. On today's show, Tom and I are going to talk to Dr. Robert S. Schick from Duke University, who is the lead researcher on a review of what is referred to as the Pilling Study, which was conducted by Syngenta. The research consisted of a four-year field study which investigated the long-term effects of repeated exposure of honeybee colonies to flowering crops that were treated with thiamatoxin. We're going to take a closer look at this study according to what the data is proposing to tell us. First, I'd like to welcome to the show my co-host, Colorado beekeeper, Mr. Tom Theobald. Hello, Tom. Hello, June, from uh, cloudy Colorado, but we've had several 60-degree days, and the bees got a little flight time. Important for them in the middle of the winter. Thank you, Tom. And our guest today, Dr. Robert Schick. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much. It's great to be here from sort of sunny North Carolina. Dr. Schick, can you tell us a little bit about your work? Sure, I'm more than happy to. So my name is Rob Schick, and I am a research scientist at Duke University, and I have recently come back to Duke after being uh, in the UK at the University of St. Andrews for the last four years. I'm a quantitative ecologist by by trade and by training. So um, while I study fun things like bees and whales and seals, it, it mostly means I spend a lot of my time on my computer performing statistical analyses dreaming about being out in the field with with these uh, fantastic creatures. A lot of my work uh, right now is based uh, on animal health, so in particular trying to see the intersection between how healthy the animals are uh, and where they're going out in space to see what we can then infer about what a disturbance might mean on an animal at a given place and time. So so trying to sort of understand um, you know, behavioral states and physiological states and, and how susceptible, how vulnerable, or um, how robust an animal might be to uh, a number of different kinds of disturbances. Thank you. Dr. Schick, can you explain what initiated your study? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, as I mentioned, I was uh, at the University of St. Andrews for four years, uh, and uh, Professor Jeremy Greenwood uh, was my sort of um, on again, off again, office mate there. Uh, he's uh, emeritus uh, faculty there and was a former uh, director of the British Trust for Ornithology for, I believe, about two decades. And, and so he would come in about once a month and, you know, we talk about all sorts of things. And when this paper had come out, uh, this Pilling and All paper that, that you mentioned in the introduction uh, in PLOS One, we started talking about it a little bit. And uh, I think around about a year and a half ago, Jeremy had written a blog post and uh, he started talking to us more specifically at uh, I was at the um, at Cream, which is the Center for Research into Ecological and Environmental Modeling. So, a group of like-minded quantitative ecologists and statisticians. So he started talking to several of us uh, about you know what were sort of some potential flaws in the analysis or, or lack of analysis they did in that paper. And one thing led to another, and we started digging into this more seriously, and then um, started the process of, of making it a formal analysis in the paper. Thank you. Dr. Schick, could you explain what were the findings? Why did Syngenta conclude that the research Pilling and his colleagues concluded were acceptable? Well, I won't speak for them, <laughs> um, but essentially what they did uh, in the paper, and the paper that was published in PLOS One, was to say, well, we're basically not going to do a, a formal statistical analysis, and the reason they chose not to was for um, now the simple reason that the study uh, lacked a lot of replicates, so they didn't have a lot of different fields where, where bees were exposed and not exposed in different places, so they only had a, a very small set of them. And so basically that, without getting into too many, too many sort of quantitative details, it means there's a lack of statistical power to make, uh, to make inference on differences whether they are there or not. So they said because of that lack of power, 
um, we're going to sort of forego a statistical analysis and, and essentially plot the data, uh, which they did in their paper and then said, you know, uh, if you had a, a, a low powered study, then the kind of result you would find is something that was very strong, like very obvious, big effect. And, and in their words, they said, when we look at the data, we don't see it. So that's fine. So basically, we don't see an effect and there's not enough replicates in the data themselves to to test for an effect formally. So, so, we'll, so we'll leave it at that. That's essentially the, the guts of it. Could you, for the non-scientific listeners in our group, just list some of the elements where you felt it failed, both statistically and in terms of the scientific design? Uh, I, I'll try to tackle some of that. Uh, I'm, I'm not an experimental design person by uh, by expertise or training, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll I'll sort of pass on that. But I will say that there are several groups uh, in the UK, uh, including a large NERC funded study right now, um, that is trying to sort of uh, imbue their study with more statistical power and more replicates to try to get at this issue. Um, where, where we felt that they they went wrong is that. Um, you know, they essentially just graphed the data, and I won't speak to them about whether they're sort of trying to do this deliberately or not. But they said, okay, here's you know, here's what the data look like for uh, bees that are exposed to the treatment, uh, and what they look like for control. And just looking at them, um, we don't see much of a difference, and so therefore we're going to say there's no real difference. Um, and sort of most commonly accepted uh, analyses in the scientific literature these days, certainly in ecology, um, that's not sufficient to say whether or not something's going on. Um, you just, you can't usually hope to send a paper to a journal and say, well, you know, we did an analysis of these data and we didn't really see a difference. Um, and so therefore there's nothing going on here. So in my, certainly in my experiences uh, publishing, that would I've never done that, and any referee would just immediately say, you know, you you can't call this a statistical analysis by just by plotting the data. That's um, you know, that's an ex a first and necessary exploratory step you would do uh, in any such analysis. So uh, again, circling back in there, I, I'm not I won't touch on the sort of the the formal design of the study. Um, but just that it's it's just not sufficient and it's just not modern scientific practice to, to, you know, to just plot something and say, well, there's definitely no difference. That that may not have been a good question on my part. Uh, I'm thinking as you speak, could you just explain in a little more detail the concept of statistical power? Sure. Um, so if you wanted to say, if you wanted to compare, say, two groups of something, you know, whether, let's say you wanted to compare the height of uh, one group of students in second grade versus one group of students in eighth grade to say whether or not these are, these are sort of statistically different, you know, can, can we, can we look at these data and, and make some inference to say, yeah, these, these groups are definitely different in height. If you had, uh, let's say two second graders and three eighth graders um, who have their own sort of range of heights, um, you might say, okay, well, they look different, but there's just there's not a lot of data here to really say for sure. Now, if you did that same test with, I'm going to grossly inflate the numbers, with 1,000 second graders and 1,000 eighth graders, all of the variation within one of those, each of those groups would be sort of swamped by the overall difference between the two groups. I mean, in most cases, kids that are six years old are going to be significantly taller than um, you know, than their younger ones. And so by having many more replicates, you can start to look at uh, the differences in those. And if you even have broadened that out to sort of eighth graders all across the country, for instance, you're just getting more and more information. And so you have more power to discern whether any differences are, uh, are significant and matter. Am I correct in saying that there were no replicates in this study? Uh, well, they had... Um, I believe they had two for rape and three for maize. So essentially they had, they had a, a control field uh, and a treatment field. And within each of those, they had six hives. And it, the exact sort of spatial array of those uh, wasn't given in their paper, and nor was the actual um, the sort of the lat long coordinates between them. So one paper that uh, criticized their, their uh, study was the top at all paper from 2015. And they said, well, the 
in terms of the spatial separation, you know, it's very likely that control and treated could have, you know, flown back and forth between these fields. There certainly wasn't sufficient replicates in this replication in the study. What would you propose if they were to redo the study that they could have done differently in order to provide more acceptable results, if you want to put it like that, or if I may put it like that? Um, yeah. Uh, well, again, I, I'll say this by you know with a caveat that uh, um, experimental design is not not my not my area of expertise, and I would certainly, if I were going to do it, I, w- I would get in touch with someone uh, for whom that is their expertise, you know, a statistician who does that for a living, and say. These are the kinds of questions I want to be asking and the kinds of differences I want to be able to see in this study and, and what do we need to be doing to get that. And, and we tried to make that point in the paper um, and we, we deliberately did not say you should have, you know, X number of sites and X number of hives in, in these types of locations, um, but, but more said, you know, you should start from from the standpoint of saying these are the kinds of differences that are important ecologically that we want to be able to discern. So if there's a, you know, a 10% decline in bee performance or something like that, whatever that number is, that at the outset you consult with, you know, someone who's who's expert in experimental design to say, okay, what do we need to do in terms of a design to to come up with that difference statistically to be able to say so. Um, yeah, it's clearly more than they had, um, and in terms of getting into actual numbers, I, I'm you know I'm just not I'm not expert enough to answer that right now. Thank you. What is the vital information that you look for in order to make a proper assessment? Is that a better question to ask? I mean, I think the the when I was trying to get at too an answer to one of Tom's questions is that. Um, you know, while everyone has sort of inherent biases, whether or not they will want to admit them as a scientist, I think your your job is to try, try to be as objective as possible about an analysis, um, you know, expressing all the limitations and whatnot and not go into it with a, a preconceived notion of what you're looking for uh, and rather to look at look at the data as, as they are. Uh, and, and but by looking at that, I mean, of course, doing exploratory analysis, but then also uh, rigorous and complete statistical analysis um, a, a, and report those to the, to the best of your ability. And if, it, if your conclusion after doing such analysis is that the study lacked power and that, you know, you can't claim a difference, whether it's positive or negative in terms of the treatment, then I think that needs to be out there. That's, that's the way science proceeds. And it's up to other people other scientists and managers and you know practitioners to to judge it on its merits. But if if you simply look at data, literally just look at them and say, well, I don't see a difference, so therefore there's no harm in, in this this treatment. It's just I don't think it's the way science should proceed. Thank you, Dr. Schick. I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show today and for taking the time to share your findings with our listeners. Well, thanks very much for having me. I appreciate all the work you both are doing and and hope this message and and our analysis gets out there. Thank you. Well, we appreciate what you've done to to bring some attention to studies like this. And thank you for taking the time to enlighten us. Great. Welcome. Thank you. And folks, please check out the companion article, which will be available on theorganicview.com. Thank you for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon.